two identical airplanes, piloted by neighbors, both heading for home. This is Bob Warner, private pilot with almost a thousand hours. Not long ago, Bob's interest in flying rubbed off on his friend, Tom Andrews. And Tom just recently got his private ticket. There's a basic difference between these two pilots. Bob is a seat of the pants fighter. He keeps a careful visual check for other aircraft, and he lets his sensations tell him how to handle the control. Some things Tom does the same way. He's just as careful about watching for other aircraft. He uses the seat of his pants too. But he also pays some attention to his instruments. He uses them to get the best performance from his airplane by getting the best combination of power setting and airspeed and he uses them to supplement the visual for navigation, altitude, heading, and attitude. Tom thinks his knowledge of the instruments will let him arrive home ahead of Bob. But Bob, of course, has the advantage of many more hours of experience. kept you. Hey, I thought I beat you here. I didn't see your airplane out there anyplace. It's already in the hangar. How'd you manage that? I even took off before you did. Just a matter of taking a look at the instruments once in a while. Ah, what's that got to do with it? Ask Larry. How about it, Larry? Makes a difference, all right, Bob. One eye on the instruments, I call it. You pay some attention to your instruments and you get more out of your airplane. And you're a safer, more skillful pilot, too. More of a pro. Well, you don't have an instrument rating, Tom. No, but I was taught to fly from the first with one eye on the instruments. You older guys. Uh, 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 uh. All right, you more experienced pilots. You learn to fly before they start teaching that way. Now, you ask me, Bob, I'd say that those guys that learn the way Tom did learn faster and they learn better. I wouldn't go back to teaching the old way even if they'd let me. Well, I guess they had a point. At my stage of the game, it seemed too late to start learning new methods. And I can't see that it would make much difference for the kind of flying I do. Most of my flying is for things like business trips to visit nearby cities, and, well, once a month or so, I take Bob Jr. up to Lake Isabella for a weekend of fishing. And then, of course, there's the inevitable trip to visit Betsy's folks. I figure the way I fly now is good enough for my needs. Oh, well, sure, I'd like to be more of a pro, but, well, I've always been a careful pilot, and I think that's the most important thing. A couple of months later, a crisis came up at work. You know, one of those times when the flying really comes in handy. Hi, Bob. Hi, Dave. What's up? Your secretary told me to rush. Oh, Miss Latronics is having some kind of a problem with our order. I told him we'd fly up to the Jackstown plant and have a look at things. Did you bring all the specifications? Yep. Got it all. Fine. Say, uh, I've never ridden in a small plane before. Um, 
Will I need sunglasses or Dramamine? Don't worry, Dave. When we get to our altitude, it'll be nice and smooth. And as for those sunglasses, I don't think you're going to need them. We have an overcast at 8,000 all the way. Well, I brought Dramamine anyway, just in case. <laughs> Good for you. I guess before we were through, Dave needed tranquilizers more than Dramamine. I had checked the local weather and the weather at Jackstown. Both were reporting the same 8,000 foot overcast. But I hadn't checked the en route weather. And before long, we were flying between cloud layers with an undercast as well as an overcast. I explained to Dave a little about VFR flying and flying on top because he seemed to get apprehensive every time we climbed to stay out of the undercast. We kept having to climb to stay on top. And then, and it happened. I climbed right into the overcast. Now keep calm. Start a 180 back to the VFR weather. Call Jackstown and make sure they're still open. Then look for a break in the undercast for the descent. Jackstown Radio, this is Cessna 2920 Yankee. Request weather at Jackstown, over. Cessna calling Jackstown Radio. Jackstown reporting 7,000 overcast, visibility 12, wind southwest 10. Say again your aircraft number, over. This is 02 Yankee, I mean 20 Yankee. We got caught between layers, turning to a southerly heading to get back to VFR weather, over. Roger 20 Yankee, state your position and altitude, over. We're at a... trouble here, but I think we're all right now. We're at 5,300. Well, we seem to be in a climb. 2-0 Yankee, maintain your altitude. Are you in a turn? Or... This is 2-0 Yankee. We've broken out of the lower cloud level at 4,500 feet. We return to home airport. Thank you, Jackstown. I'm changing the tower frequency now. All the way home, those few minutes kept running through my mind. Only everything was all jumbled up. What I did know was that one minute I was in the cloud layer, almost stalling, and the next minute, I was barreling down on a power spiral. And I wouldn't admit it to Dave, but I knew darn well that if the cloud base had been closer to the ground, I could never have recovered in time. We finally made it to Jackstown late that day, by car. In the weeks that followed, I went about my usual routine. I was pretty busy. I hadn't been doing any flying, so one day I stopped by the airport to check over the plane. telling somebody about it. Larry was the obvious choice. I don't know how long it took, Larry, but I lost a couple of thousand feet mighty fast. I guess I'm pretty lucky at that. I could have pulled the wings off of it. You said it. You know, about a hundred pilots a year fly into that kind of weather and never make it out again. A hundred guys just like you. And a lot more pile up in perfectly good weather by stalling close to the ground. But you know, a lot of those guys would probably still be alive. If they'd kept one eye on the instruments, then. Now you're catching on. 
Your friend Tom, now, he's got nowhere near the flight time you have. But in some ways, he's more of a pro than you are. He's got several hours under the hood, maintaining the attitude of his plane solely by reference to his instruments. Well, I, I know, but nowadays you have to do this to get a private ticket, don't you? For good reason, too. They found it makes a man a safer and more careful pilot. Oh, I'm not trying to draw up any business, Bob, but I think you might get a lot of good out of it. Are you talking about an instrument certificate? No, no. No, just the Blue Seal flight instruction. When you finish it, you get a Blue Seal added to your certificate to show that you've demonstrated the ability to maintain your attitude by reference to your instruments. At that point, I guess I didn't need much more convincing. And a few days later, I was out with Larry for my first Blue Seal lesson. My biggest problem at the beginning was, was trying to unlearn the habit of flying by the seat of my pants. He had to remind me over and over again that when you're under the hood, you have to ignore your sensations. couple of hours, the message didn't seem to sink in. But then I began to get the hang of it, and we started doing turns, climbs, and glides. time I was picking it up a lot faster and I was really beginning to enjoy myself. He showed me how to use the gyro horizon. You know, everybody seems to have their own way of visualizing this gadget. To me, the small part in the center represents my airplane and the long line, the horizon. If I get into a nose high attitude, it shows me, nose above the horizon, so I know I have to ease forward on the controls. If I get the left wing low, it shows me left wing below the horizon, so I apply right aileron and rudder. Then he taught me how to use the airspeed indicator to detect attitude changes. An increase of airspeed means I've dropped the nose. I soon got so I could correct the attitude before the altimeter or rate of climb indicator showed much change. I learned to make a smooth standard rate turn by holding the needle on the first line with the ball centered. An attitude adjusted to hold a constant altitude. I guess concentrating on one instrument and forgetting to look at the others is a common fault of learners. But the proper way, Larry kept reminding me, is to scan all the instruments and not spend too long on any one. Soon I found that even when I wasn't under the hood, I'd cross-check the instruments regularly. Larry's one eye on the instruments was becoming part of my way of flying. And I realized that my altitude and directional control were better than they had ever been. After about eight hours of instruction, Larry recommended me for my Blue Seal flight test. By that time, I was really enjoying flying again, the way I did when I was first learning. And I decided to go on and get my instrument ready. But even with just my Blue Seal time, I already knew that Larry was right. I was a better pilot and a safer pilot.